ever since I was a little girl, I've always had gut health issues. I mean, I can remember back to when I was, uh, you know, probably 10, 11 years old. Every time I would eat something, I would have dinner, I would complain of getting a stomach ache. And my mom got to the point where it was like, okay, well, everything you put in your mouth actually causes digestive upset. And back then, I mean, I was born in 1970. Back then, nobody was talking about gut health issues, allergies, sensitivities. I mean, gluten intolerance. It wasn't a thing back then and or dairy intolerance, which now I know I'm completely lactose intolerant and have been. It's, it's in my genes that I'm lactose intolerant. But the more that we learn about gut health, and we've come so far in the research and also in just understanding it better, the more that we can understand that what we're putting in our body, perhaps for some of us, we can't digest certain foods. And for some of us, we can, right? We're all different and we all have different gut microbiomes. And I'm actually, you know, and I've talked about this before. I talked about this on my 100th episode, but the reason I became a nutritionist was because of my gut health issues. So I thank, I'm so grateful for my gut health issues because that led me to the world of health and wellness, which I've been in, it'll be 25 years next year. And when I was in my 20s, so I've, like I said, I've had gut health issues since I'm little, but when I was in my 20s, it got to the point where anything and everything that I put into my mouth was causing gas and bloating. I couldn't eat anything without looking literally like four months pregnant by the end of the day. And I remember at one point, uh, it that was probably, I don't know, I was, I was in, I was engaged. I don't know if I was engaged yet, but I was with my now husband and I was lying in bed one day and I was so bloated and I was so uncomfortable. And I looked at him and I was like, you know what, Rich, this is, I, I can't go on like this. this. It reminds me of like my menopause story, right? With my hot flashes. I can't continue like this because I'm so uncomfortable and can't eat anything without feeling awful. And that led me down the path of trying to understand our body. And that's why I went back to school to become a nutritionist. So I'm excited for today's conversation because this is my wheelhouse. This is what I've been studying for the last 25 years. This is what I truly have, you know, made an effort to educate myself on only because I went through it and I've had so many gut health issues. So I'm excited to introduce you to today's guest. But before I do that, I just want to do a quick introduction to those of you who are new to me and my podcast. I'm Andrea Donsky. I'm a nutritionist for, it'll be 20 years next year. I'm a menopause educator and a menopause researcher. I am passionate about research for women in perimenopause and menopause. And my whole goal of doing this podcast and for launching my business, Morphous, with my business partner, Randy, is to help empower you to take control of your health and symptoms with nutrition, lifestyle, supplements, and research. Today's interview is a little bit different than usual as I'm speaking with two people. The first person is Dr. Chidozi Ojibor. He's a PhD and scientist with over 15 years with research experience in bacterial genetics. He has a bachelor's in microbiology and obtained his PhD in molecular genetics from the University of Toronto. Dr. Ojibor has spent a decade developing novel antimicrobial entities that target disease-causing bacteria in complex biological ecosystems such as the gut. My second guest is Linta Mustafa. She holds a BHSC in medical science specializing in genetics. She adeptly combines her profound comprehension of scientific research with strong business acumen, skillfully transforming complex scientific concepts into powerful tools. Both Linta and Chidozi founded Vitract, the fastest growing gut microbiome company focused on understanding gut dysbiosis. Vitrack combines molecular microbiology, complex math, and AI to transform our gut health. Now, here's Linta and Chidozi. Welcome to Menopause Reimagined, Linta and Chidozi. Good to be here, Andrea. Thanks for having us. I am. I'm excited because, first of all, I know both of you, and we've been wanting to do this for a while, and I'm excited about the topic because we're going to be talking about the microbiome today. So I think I'd like to set the stage for definitions. So what is the microbiome and why should we care about the microbiome? Yeah, I think I, I think I can take that. Um, in very simple terms, is the microbiome is just the totality of microorganisms and all their genetic functionalities. Um, and when I talk about microorganisms, I'm talking about bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites, et cetera, um, that are found um, in your gut. Um, some of them are localized within the small intestine, but a larger portion are localized within the large intestine. 
And they're playing very key roles, such as digesting your food, helping you extract nutrients from it. In the large intestine, they do more fermentation, but it's beyond that they're producing very beneficial metabolites that you know contribute to health. And um, the reason they're very important is that we know that there are certain signatures that underlie health and disease. And I'm pretty sure we're going to go more into that in this conversation. I love that, Chidozi. So, and and as a nutritionist, for me, the gut is super important, right? And now we know so much more about the gut and the brain and how they're all interconnected through the vagus nerve. When you talk about gut health in 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 particular, how much of our environment and the food that we're eating or the think products we're putting on our skin play a role? Well, they, they play a very crucial role. Actually, one of the most um, important modifiers of the gut ecosystem is the food that we eat. Um, because, you know, by eating certain kinds of food, it enriches certain groups of bacteria. Um, and the enrichment of certain groups of bacteria then contributes to health and disease. I'll, I'll take a very quick example. Um, we know from academic literature that, you know, the Western culture of, you know, eating lots of processed foods and, you know, high saturated fat foods tend to enrich certain bacteria in the gut that, you know, contributes to disease. Um, and we see this to be very different from, you know, people who are doing more farm to table or people who are living in more conservative societies where they're eating a more well-rounded diet, whole foods, nuts, grains, seeds, um, tend to enrich, you know, organisms that are mostly, you know, involved in the fermentation of dietary fiber, and those are producing metabolites that are very important for your health. So food is a very key uh, modifiable factor. Um, and environment, you know, I know a lot of people, when we talk about food, they talk about environment, we're just talking about food, but there's other things too, like chemicals in the environment, you know, and we've seen, you know, the issue with growing our gluten with uh, our, our soy and, you know, most food products with herbicides such as glyphosate. And we've seen how that has impacted, you know, not just human health, but the microbiome has been heavily, heavily impacted. So environment plays a key role as well. I like that you said that because there are people out there who say glyphosate doesn't impact and GMO foods are fine. So are you seeing that in what you're doing or are you stating that's from like the research that's out there? You know, mostly from the research, um, we know that, you know, starting from the 1950s, when we started seeing increased use of glyphosate on, you know, in, you know, growing and treating, you know, soy and other forms of foods, uh, we've seen a concomitant increase in several chronic illnesses, um, some of them brain health issues, such as autism. And, you know, there are studies that have actually shown how um, there might actually be a link between you know, the increase in the use of these kind of chemicals and chronic illnesses. And, and I think that's something that a lot of people have to pay attention to. We've also seen situations where people actually think that, you know, they are, you know, they, they have gluten intolerance and then they move out of the U.S. or Canada and go to maybe Europe, Europe, Europe. and then suddenly they don't have gluten intolerance anymore. It just, you know, that gives it away that, was it gluten intolerance mm. in the first place? It's most likely the chemicals that are being used to, to grow these foods. And I think that those things are very, very key. Unfortunately, these are questions that we're not able to capture um, in the way we practice medicine today. But um, absolutely, the environment plays a huge role in modifying the microbiome and contributing to health and disease. So how many, how much bacteria do we have that we have? And I know it's like trillions, right? Like, give us a little bit of a background on the bacteria and also, what it's, what it's important for? Oh, yeah, we have trillions of bacteria um, in, in the gut microbiome, um, in your gut. Um, and those bacteria, coupled with the things that are produced, what we call them metabolites. And that's why we always talk about genetic functionalities. It's not just about who's there. It's about what they're doing there. Um, those bacteria are producing things like vitamins and producing short-chain fatty acids and producing all these beneficial metabolites, some of them when they overgrow are producing like toxins and all of that, um, they all play a role in the way the microbiome is shaped. And that has, you know, a cascading effect on the impact on your health. And so the gut microbiome is not just made up of bacteria, but bacteria make up 90 to 95% of it. And that's why when people talk about the gut microbiome, it looks like people are mostly talking about gut bacteria. It's just because right. they make the largest portion of it. But there's also fungi and viruses and parasites. And I like to mention here that when you talk about the gut microbiome, you're not talking about any organism in isolation. 
because this is a very complex biological ecosystem of organisms, you know, where, you know, they're interacting with one another in different ways through immune cell signaling, through, you know, by modulating processes by producing certain metabolites that other crossfeeders then use as substrates to produce them more metabolites. So it's a very, very complex ecosystem. And, and that's why when you talk about a microbiome, you, you can't really talk about things um, just in isolation. You have to think about microbiome as, you know, that complex system and how you can really understand the interaction between different organisms. So in terms of how they function, you know, one of the I think one of the biggest challenges in the field that a lot of people have amplified, um, which is, which, you know, thankfully we are beginning to see a lot of progress is that a lot of people can't really define what, what, uh, you know, a healthy microbiome is. It's like, oh, but what is, what is a healthy microbiome? Like we know that Linta's microbiome is going to be different from my microbiome is going to be different from Andrea's microbiome and all of us can be healthy, but you know, so how do you define a healthy microbiome? But I think that that conversation, we've been distracted a lot by that conversation that we are actually beginning to miss the point. The point is not to define exactly what a healthy micro, what the gut composition of a healthy microbiome should be. Rather, it is to start looking out for the fingerprints and, you know, the signatures of the microbiome that underlie health and disease. And so when you're looking at, a, you know, a gut, you know, a gut microbiome profile, that is associated with good health. There are certain things, irrespective of all these other confounding factors, there are certain things that have been we've seen that you know that tend to be conserved. One is gut diversity. We know that you know the increase in the number of species actually correlates with gut health. So the more number of species you have, the more diverse they are, you know, the, the healthier you're likely to be. And also we, we begin to see beneficial, you know, the prevalence of beneficial organisms, what we call the probiotics bacteria, the common cells that are producing all these very key uh, metabolites, like I mentioned, like your butyrate, your acetate, your your pyronates, your B vitamins, you know, all of these are beneficial metabolites. And even things like, you know, your, you know, antioxidants and, you know, things that, you know, these microorganisms can actually take, you know, metabolize to produce very important um, other metabolites that are very important to aging and anti-cancer effect and anti oxidant effect and all that. Um, so those are the ways to look at it. And then in terms of disease, you're also looking at, you know, organisms that are potentially producing toxins um, or a buildup of gases that can contribute to, you know, gastrointestinal diseases or, or you know, the progression of it. Hmm. And I, I like that you're talking about there's other things too, because it's true when we think of bacteria and the bacteria isn't necessarily bad. Like we know that we have to have that ratio. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how we, how much, you know, and I don't love using the word good versus bad bacteria or healthy or beneficial bacteria versus, you yeah. know, not beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some, I, I understand why, you know, it, it, it looks like, a lot of times when we talk about microbiome, people want to sit on the fence about, oh, what's healthy and what's not healthy. And that's that's simply because an organism that is healthy, um, when they overgrow, can actually then begin to modulate some processes that, that then become unhealthy. A very perfect example is, you know, when you look at hydrogen sulfide as a gas, which we know is built up in the gut, um, some level of hydrogen sulfide is actually good for you. They actually contribute to your gut barrier integrity. They help to keep that internal homeostasis. They actually do have an anti-inflammatory effect. But the problem now is when you have organisms such as pathobionts, which we know um, some of them are sulfate reducing bacteria, the byproduct of what they produce then is hydrogen sulfide. If you have an overgrowth of that, you tend to see a build up of hydrogen sulfide that in itself, an overproduction of hydrogen sulfide in your gut microenvironment can actually set the stage for disease. Um, an example is we know that a very key substrate of hydrogen sulfide is the mucous membrane of your gut epithelium. So high levels of hydrogen sulfide can actually break that down. That can set the stage for inflammation. We've seen people that have also reported extra, you know, digestive health, extra intestinal you know, issues like blood, uh, like um, brain fog, and there's been associations between high levels of hydrogen sulfide and uh, and brain fog. Other examples include things like methane. We know that a buildup of methane, actually, this is very, very right. well established in literature for people, for example, who have constipation predominant IBS, we tend to see that they tend to be enriched in, you know, methane producing bacteria. And we know that that can contribute to the slowing down of, of food across your gastrointestinal tract. So that's the, the gut transit time. So it's beyond just, 
you know, looking at um, um, good versus bad, but it's all about balance. And that's why there's the terminology dysbiosis. It's about balance. Anything that disrupts that balance is imbalance. And that's what dysbiosis is. You know, when we when we look at women in perimenopause and menopause and you're looking at gut health, and I know we, you and I and Linta, we've spoken about doing some research for women in this phase of life, which I really think would be super crucial because so much is changing as we enter into perimenopause and menopause. Have you studied the gut of, let's say, a baby when a baby is born versus a teenager versus, you know, a woman who's pregnant versus somebody who's older, a senior or someone in menopause? Like, have you looked at the different because you've tested how Linda, how many tests to date have you done? Because you've done quite a bit. It's over thousands. It's in the thousands. Yeah, we have thousands of data points at this point. So what have you noticed or what have you seen when you looked at the different data points in, in different life stages? I can speak to that. I mean, we we already know, I and mean, this is very well established in literature, that, you know, your gut um, composition changes. It evolves um, as you age. All right. So it's not I know a lot of times a lot of people talk about diet, how diet impacts the gut. But there's other things, you know, your environment, age, your genetics, all of those factors also impact your gut. And we've seen very well established um um, metamorphosis of, of the gut um, environment as, as you transit across age. We've also seen differences like, you know, we, some studies have actually also shown differences with, you know, even gender. It's like, you know, men having been more likely to have some sort of archetype versus, versus women. But I think that um, the way we should, you know, start thinking about these things is you, when you're looking at people's gut microbiome profile, it is the metadata associated with those people that actually helps you to gain a deeper insight into people's gut profile. And you've mentioned a very key example, you know, premenopausal versus like postmenopausal women or perimenopausal women. Um, we, you know, there are very there's certain things that we've seen that, you know, as people go from, you know, pre to peri and then to post, that shift in their gut microbiome composition. And unfortunately, a lot of studies that have been done um, generally in science and, of course, in, in microbiome research as well have mostly included men. But I'm happy to see that, you know, in recent time, we're beginning to understand the importance of very key components of human biology, such as the gut microbiome in women's health. An example here is you look at premenopausal women and we know that, you know, the, you know, the prevailing levels of estrogen, you know, plays remarkable role in, in women's health. That is what we tend to see decline when, you know, you're getting into your premenopausal your perimenopausal and your postmenopausal stage. And a lot, a lot of times people don't think about how the microbiome actually plays a role in that. It happens that the microbiome actually plays a very key role in that. Yes. Yeah, so we know your estrogen is producing your ovaries. It is, you know, it is, it goes into circulation, but it is metabolized in your liver. When it's metabolizing your liver, there is a lot of conjugation that happens there because, you know, estrogen itself is very, is it's, it's lipid soluble, it's fat soluble. But if for it to be excreted, you want it to be water soluble. So the conjugation that happens in, in the liver actually allows it to be water soluble. Then it gets it gets passed down to the intestine. Now, the fate of that estrogen in the intestine is decided by your gut microbiome microorganisms. So your gut bacteria, for example, help you to deconjugate your estrogen, um, the conjugated estrogen, and those go back into circulation. Now, in the case where you have dysbiosis, and that's why we always talk to people and tell people that the lasting impact of dysbiosis is unimaginable. It is unimaginable because now if you have dysbiosis and you, you have an enrichment of organisms that can't actually really deconjugate some of this conjugated estrogen, what happens is that you then tend to have lower levels of estrogen going back into circulation and that impacts, you know, women's health. And so organisms that have enzymes such as beta glucuronidases play a very, very huge role in, in you know, in, in women's health. Another thing I can think on top of my head is we do know that, you know, a lot of gut microorganisms actually can metabolize things like even like isoflavones that, you know, we get from soy and right. other legumes. They can actually metabolize them to equal. And I know that one of the things that, you know, women who are going through perimenopausal and postmenopausal stages complain about is hot flashes. And we have seen in literature that things like equal actually help to ameliorate, you know, symptoms of hot flashes in many um, um, women going through this perimenopause to, and, and postmenopause. And the difference there might actually just be 
the equal producing versus, you know, organisms that are, you know, disparate in this different set of women. So when we start going down to the intricacies of how the gut microbiome actually plays a role in these things, um, it sets the stage for us to start thinking about, you know, potential treatments or therapeutic strategies that we can, we can take that has a gut microbiome component. Chidozi, you're saying equal. What's that? Yeah. So equal is a metabolite that is produced from, you know, the me microbial meta me metabolism of isoflavones. So mm. um, when you have the right kinds of organisms in your gut, um, organisms such as lactobacillus, um, bifidobacterium brevi, bifidobacterium longum, egatella, these organisms have the genetic capacity to break down um this isoflavones into a metabolite such as equal, and this equal have been shown to actually play a huge role in, you know, reducing the symptoms of hot flashes in perimenopausal or postmenopausal women. How do you spell equal? E Q U O L. E Q U O L. Okay, perfect. So you're talking about, you know, what's interesting to me, you know, when we look at gut bacteria, how much of it is genetics? Like, for example, let's say what part of the world you come from, race, um, culture, like how much does that play a role in terms of what our gut microbiome is made up of? And then how does that change or, or can it change over time? And how yeah. is that? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, and it's interesting you're asking me because by training, I'm actually a molecular geneticist. And a lot of times, um, you know, the old knowledge of biology kind of like considers your genes to be your fate. It's like, oh, because you're made up of this way, you're made this way genetically, then that's your fate, you're condemned. But that but we are increasingly become beginning to understand that that's not essentially true. Because it's not just about a genetic makeup. Uh, it is the expression of those genes. Like what can turn those genes on and what can turn them off? Right. So it, it goes beyond. So, and, and this is one of the reasons why things like diet plays a huge role. Right. So, you you know, while your diet actually helps to, you know, um, select for the type of organisms that are going to predominate in your gut, those the active ingredients in those diets also play a role in turning on and turning off certain things in your genes. So genes play a role, of course, but actually the biggest modifiable factor of what impacts your gut microbiome is the food that you eat your lifestyle. And I think that this is why um, I'm very excited about the space because it means that you can actually do something about your health. You know, some chronic illnesses can actually be reversed if you take certain strategies, especially if those strategies are hyper-personalized to you. Okay. So that's where I'm like, okay, let's get into the testing. So Linda, talk about what, what inspired you to start Vitract with Chidozi? I think we have the perfect blend of personal experience and technical experience that when we put our heads together, um, we've been able to build a product like this. And I'll talk about that from a background perspective on myself. So I used to be a former net, former wrestler. I've been an athlete my whole life. Um, and I had the onset of inflammation in my joints at the age of 20. So I was very young and I started to have all this inflammation. I went to go see my doctor immediately. They knew it was an arthritis. Um, but long story short, I spent a lot of time in traditional allopathic care, seeing autoimmune doctors, um, getting all types of different diagnoses, you know, backtrack of diagnoses. And um, eventually I ended up reading a bunch of research papers myself. Um, I also have a background in genetics. And so like Shirazi was saying, became fascinated with how nutrition can modify um, our health in actually such a meaningful, tangible way. Um, ended up finding a great integrative care practitioner, worked with her for about five months and completely reversed all of my inflammation. And that completely changed my life. So I went on to go do other things. You know, I worked in banking. I was building another company in the longevity space where we were actually trying to figure out the difference between your molecular and your biological age. Um, and then I ended up running into Chirozi and, you know, as we put our heads together, he also had a very similar experience. He had to take a step back from his PhD um, for three weeks, right, Chirozi? For Six weeks six weeks for a significant amount of time um, that he wasn't feeling well. And it was just this onset of inflammation. So we 
when we sat down and we looked at the microbiome space at large, we saw this huge problem, but also this huge opportunity where mm -hmm. we know, as Shirozi was saying, people are asking all these questions around what we know about the microbiome and what we don't know. And today there's a lot that we do know. Um, and that means we can design testing and interventions that are really personalized. And one of the main things that we wanted to do in this field was look at where the gaps were. And the main places that we see the gaps today are the testing is extremely inaccessible for most people. It's very, very expensive and it's not very actionable. So we've seen that there can be some great deep dive pathogen tests that practitioners are using. And those are those are great tools, um, but where they sort of end is after taking a snapshot of the microbiome, where we wanted to pick up was from exactly that point, was now that we know what's in the gut, how can we modify the gut? So we've done a lot of work on studying and implementing information around bacterial modifiers um, in our test. And our test also is significantly more affordable, meaning you can repeat test, you know, you can see if interventions are actually working or not, you can test the whole family. So it really changes the way practitioners interact with, with integrative testing. Can you explain what Vitract is? Like, what is gut testing? So for those who are listening, who've never had it done before, what does that mean? So you essentially take a sample of your stool. We run a uh, genetic testing on it. For us, it's 16S RNA testing. And then what we do from there is we stratify the test into different sections. So the first section really gives you a sense of your health score and your diversity score, because as Josie was saying, that's very important to look at. Your gut diversity is a really important signature that can tell a lot of information um, to practitioners and customers about their gut health at large. But then we show you section two, which is all about what's in the microbiome. We take all the information that we picked up from the genetic tests and we stratify the bacteria into probiotic bacteria. So quote unquote, good bacteria, commensals. These are the bugs that keep the homeostasis in the microbiome and then pathobionts, which like Shirozi also was saying, you know, it's normal for these bugs to be in, in the microbiome in small quantities. It's just when they overgrow, it becomes a problem. So it's important to look at everything in, in the spectrum. Um, so we show you everything that's in there and then we show you what they likely could be producing. So now we know from literature that certain bugs produce certain neurotransmitters or certain toxins um, or, you know, your oxalate and your lactose degraders, et cetera. Um, and then the last section, which is what I was talking about, which is all about modifying that bacteria. We pull everything from that first section around things that were out of range, and then we show you how you can modify it to get it into the optimal ranges. Um, our recommendations are centered around nutrition, lifestyle, um, supplements, and prebiotics and probiotics. Mm. You, you, you mentioned the word pathobionts. Can you just spell it just so for those who are listening, just so, because sometimes when you're, or like when you're listening to it orally, like you don't yeah. really know. So just spell that so people can understand what that is. It's P-A-T-H-O, patho, and then bionts, B-I-O-T-N-T-S, B-I-O-N-T-S. Patho, bionts, got it. And those are, are they the same thing as pathogens? Like, is that how you think of it? Or is it just completely like kind of the same maybe? So the way that we classify, you, actually, this is a really good question, is we have pathobionts, which is, you know, quote unquote, pathogenic bacteria in the microbiome that in low amounts are totally fine to be in the microbiome. But then we actually have a separate section called the exogenous pathogen section. And these are your typical pathogenic bacteria, you know, um, salmonella, et cetera, things that really shouldn't be in the microbiome at all. Um, so there is kind of a differentiation between those two. If somebody wants to get a sense of what their gut is. So when I think of the gut microbiome, I think of, well, I think of like, you know, how to feed it. I think of prebiotics. I think of probiotics. I think of postbiotics because that's, what's really, you know, out there right now. And a lot of you who are listening, you might've been hearing a lot about the pre and the pro and the post. And there's a lot, there are a lot of companies out there who are making different things when we talk about. So when you give the, you know, the, the, you know, how to help the microbiome, how to improve it, the solutions, 
are you giving people like, so through nutrition, obviously, are you telling them the type of bacteria they should be taking? Like, give us a little bit of a, of a, an understanding of when somebody gets back this test, what can they expect to see? So we show you a lot of different ways that you can tackle the same problem. And then it kind of becomes, you know, it's up to, this is where it goes from a science to an art in terms of how you want to create that protocol. This is why we always recommend it's great to work with a practitioner because they know you well, they can piece together all the information around your health symptoms, your disease states, um, you know, the, your lifestyle, how you respond to certain things, and then put together a protocol for you specifically. But the main way we know that the main sort of modifier that we recommend really is, as Shirozi was saying, nutrition is so, so powerful in being able mm -hmm. to modify the microbiome. But that doesn't mean things like prebiotics and probiotics are not effective, right? It's That can be extremely effective as well. So we show you all the different ways that you can either upregulate or sort of decrease the quantities of a certain bacteria. And I think what's really interesting and what the average person might not think about is certain bugs in your body prefer to feed on certain foods. That means the type of foods that you eat are actually really going to decide the type of bugs that start to grow in larger quantities in the gut. That's how you use nutrition to modify the gut. You know, I love it because as a nutritionist, we look at food first, right? It's always food first. And then we have supplements because we want to supplement what we're doing, because unfortunately our soil is depleted of so many nutrients that, you know, I do believe 1000% that we do need supplements. So when we look at what we're eating, you know, we think of always like eat the rainbow and make sure that you're eating lots of different things. I mean, you've mentioned, Shadozi, you mentioned diversity. And I think Linda, you too, you mentioned diversity a few times. Why is diversity so important? And how are we getting that diversity from the food that we're eating? Is it important? Like, give us a bit of a background on how we should be looking. Because when we look at diet, we're like, you know, my mantra is follow a whole foods diet as best as you can. Eliminate things that we know that are not great for our gut microbiome, like ultra processed foods and sugars and carbohydrates, the ultra processed stuff that we know just don't do any good for our gut microbiome, right? And in some cases can be harmful for us. So can you give us an understanding of what, you know, for everybody who's listening, be like, okay, so, how, you know, I'm, I love the idea of the testing, by the way, I think it's brilliant. And I'm a huge believer in getting things tested, not guessing what's, what's wrong with you, but actually getting it tested. And I love that your test is affordable. And we're going to talk about that at the end. We also have a special discount code for all of you who are listening and who do want to get this. So I'm excited about that. But Chajosi, give us a bit of an idea of what eating the rainbow, like eating that, that diversity and how it affects our microbiome. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. And, and I think that um, I'm happy that the conversation is also happening on a larger scale now. Like you go to Netflix and there's a lot of like um, shows now talking about the gut microbiome. That knowledge is becoming, is becoming more democratized every day. Um, but I think that when I think about this, I, I usually think about it on two scales. One is, you know, the regular scale, basic scale, which is, oh, as much as possible, you want to avoid, ultra, you know, doing ultra post processed foods, packaged foods, you know, added sugars, refined carbs, all of those things. And because we have just, we have just seen that those things set the stage for inflammation in your gut and inflammation and your gut microbiome, um, they, they, it's like a two way street. They impact one another in, you know, when there is a lot of inflammation, it breaks down your gut and bio integrity, you know, and then you start to see an enrichment of pathogenic organisms. They begin to grow. They begin to produce metabolites that are pathogenic as well. And they, they further degrade your gut bio integrity. And then it becomes a cascade and they, it cycles. It doesn't matter which comes first. It's like the food you're mm -hmm. eating is impacting your gut microbiome exactly. or the food biochemistry itself is just impacting your gut health and that is impacting your gut microbiome. So that is the first scale that I like to think about. And then on the other hand, it's like, you know, if you're not eating all these ultra processed foods and it makes sense to be doing all those rainbows and all that, why are those rainbows, like rainbow foods important in the first place is because they just have active ingredients that these microorganisms prefer to feed on, right? So they have all these active ingredients, you know, isoflavones, they have all of this Ingredients that when they ferment, because you have to think about the gut microbiome as, you know, a system where different organisms preferentially localize in different components of the gut. So some organisms would, you know, rather live in the small intestine because, you know, the pH there is better for them to thrive. The, you know, the conditions there, the oxygen level there allows them to thrive. Now, those organisms are the ones that can actually, you know, degrade your food in terms of like help you digest them. But 
what happens to the foods that cannot be digested? They go to the colon, and then you have these organisms that then ferment them. That's why you want you should be doing more rainbows because it's a lot of fermentation. That's why you should be doing a lot of dietary fibers. They ferment them. They produce beneficial metabolites. And those are the things that we know have been consistently reported to be associated with health. So that's the that's the first stage. The second stage is the, the piece of the hyper-personalization. And I think that this part is very, very key because, yes, I need to eat all the, you know, dietary fibers, the fermented foods, the nuts, grain seeds, all that stuff. Okay, good. But there are people who can't, all right? For example, <laughs> if you have visceral hypersensitivity, which is very common in individuals that have IBS, you know, you can't afford to tolerate things like gases, like, you know, hydrogen or the FODMAP. Because the FODMAP foods, the high FODMAP foods. So what do you do? That is where you start thinking about hyper-personalization. What kind of food would provide me with, you know, these substrates that are beneficial for my health, um, but at the same time, I wouldn't be producing too much acids or too much gases that would then impact my health? Or can I, at this point, not really do foods? Can I just supplement, all right? So if I need butyrate, for example, rather than enrich organisms that are going to produce butyrate in the gut, um, and how do I enrich them? I have to eat, you know, do a lot of dietary fiber, but if I can't take them, can I just supplement directly with butyrate? So I think, you know, that is the other stage, and that goes back to what Linta was saying, working with practitioners is really, really powerful. And I think that this is actually how the change in this space would come. Because when you work with practitioners, you get all this other metadata that goes beyond, oh, it's rainbow foods to what is in it for you, you, that hyper-personalization. I think that that's the, that's the key thing there. No, what if somebody's not working with a practitioner? Can they still get your test? Is it very simple to understand? Yes, yeah. very, very easily digestible. Um, and, you know, I like Linda talking about this, but one of the things that we have also done is, you know, we give access to, you know, some practitioners that we work with because we know that some people are, you know, direct to cons consumers, they, they're just direct consumers, they just buy directly from the website. Right. But at the end of the day, if you're buying, it's because you're probably dealing with one gut health issue or the other. Um, so we always encourage that even if you don't have a practitioner, reach out to us. We have a huge pool of practitioners who are using the test that we can connect you to. Mm, yeah. And good. back to that point um, that Shadozi was mentioning is the way that we designed the test was to be as legible and actionable as possible. So when you when you look at the test report itself, it has two main columns. And on the left hand side, you'll see the name of the bacteria. You'll see how much of it is in your gut at percentage wise. And then you'll see the actual percentage range. So it's really easy to just read those numbers and figure out where you are sitting in the range. And then we'll also say either low, optimal, or high. So it's very easy to read. And then in the left-hand side column, the title is implication. So if something is low or too high, we tell you exactly what the implication is of that, right? And the reason we've made it so easy to understand and read is because we want the average person to be able to pick up a test. And if they if they want to go through it themselves and they want to put in the effort to read through all the biomarkers and you know the things that are off and, and work through that themselves, they can do that um, versus a lot of the existing options. They kind of read like lab testing, right? So mm -hmm. um, if you aren't designed or trained to, to read a lab test, um, you, you know, you're not able to understand them. And I think having it that's easy to understand is important because not everybody works with a practitioner or wants to work with a practitioner. So I think if it's yeah. easy for them to get and understand, but they still want to figure out what's wrong with them, I think I think that's an important point. And what what kind of things, so Chidozi, you mentioned a few times like illness, chronic illness, like what are the kind of things that you could determine from getting your tests that people may be like, okay, like if, if I'm having allergic reactions to things and I can't figure out what it is, is that something that it can help with? What type of information can people expect to receive by getting this test? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a very good question. And I think that this is an opportunity to reemphasize um, that this is not a diagnostic test, all right? Rather, it's a functional test that actually gives you a deeper insight into what's happening in your gut and how that shift, the bacterial shift in your gut or the your gut bacterial composition can actually give you an insight into the symptoms that you're having and what you can do to actually shift your gut to a healthier state and then hope and then see how those symptoms are alleviated. So what, you know, one of the things that we have seen, the kind of people who are taking the test mostly 
it goes from people having actually actual digestive issues from like, you know, IBS to, you know, UC Crohn's, um, people dealing with like functional constipation um, to bloating, just having symptoms like diarrhea, bloating and et cetera. But thankfully we're beginning to understand every, you know, I, I think at this point, the microbiome field is at a stage where we now know that there's a lot of extra intestinal um, conditions that the microbiome actually um, regulates. Um, so we have, you know, practitioners who are, mostly interested in insulin resistance and diabetes and obesity that are also looking at the gut microbiome um, and their specific signatures that they're looking for. Um, we also have, like, we just talked about women's health. People, you know, they don't, you know, it's not like they have a medical condition. Um, they're just going through a phase of their lives and they're having certain symptoms and they want to see how the manipulation of the microbiome can actually help to improve um, those symptoms. So um, what you can get from this is you can get an insight into not just your gut bacterial composition, but the relative abundances of the different organisms, which we consider to be signatures to underlie your health and disease. And then you can also, from there, extrapolate insights into what they may be producing and how those things that they are producing can actually impact your health. And one thing i like to mention here is that the reason you have to always look at the microbiome is that it's the melting pot for everything. When you think root cause medicine, just go there. And that's what you need to be looking at because, you know, I've seen all sorts of tests and all sorts of metadata, like people dealing with from, you know, anxiety to depression. I was just going to say mental health, you know, whether you're looking at mental You know, health all of well. those things to diabetes, to yeah. um, use and all that. And then you see everything still goes back to, oh, maybe they have a leaky gut. Or maybe they're not just producing, you know, beneficial metabolites enough. It's like the root cause, you know, is is so powerful that you see all these metabolic syndromes and everything. So it mm-hmm. ties back to the gut microbiome. I think that, I think that this. I know we talk about it a lot in the scientific, you know, arena, and now that information is becoming more democratized. But I think that this is the future. What we are, and that's what we are happy to be part of the conversation, building that kind of you know, data set that can catalyze that next generation of microbiome-based therapeutics. Could people get your tests from all over the world? Right now, we only uh, ship to the U.S. and Canada. Okay, so North America right now. Yep. Okay, and do you, expa- do you expect to expand to other parts of the world? Absolutely. Recently, we've been seeing a lot of demand from the U.K., other parts of the world, and in Europe. So we plan to build out that shipping infrastructure over the next year or so. Okay, great. We also have a lot of listeners who are in Australia, New Zealand, so I know that they'll be interested as well. Okay, great. So it'll get out there. You know, as somebody who is so fascinated with data, I mean, I am obsessed with data and which is why I'm like, love saying I'm like this a menopause researcher. What have you seen? So for me, when I look at data from our surveys, I'm always like trying to say, oh, this is really cool or that is unbelievable. Or I'm looking at like what what's tracking for several people. What would you say is some of the like most interesting data that you've come across now that you've looked yeah. at thousands of, of gut microbiomes? Yeah. Yeah, actually several. Um, one that, you know, I like to, you know, refer to a lot is, you know, people who have IBS, constipation, predominant IBS. Um, you know, we tend to, you know, you look at our data on the back end and we tend to see that they actually do have an enrichment of organisms that are known to be methane producers, um, especially um, an archaea producing, an, an, archaea, an archaea, which is pretty much a methanogen, a methane producing bacteria um, called methanobrevibacter. And, and when you think about it uh, at the molecular level, um, it kind of like makes sense because we know that methane actually slows God's transit time. And Gut transit time in itself is a very, very key factor in, you know, determining inter-individual variability in people's gut microbiome composition, because the longer time of food stays in a particular location in your gut helps to determine which organisms will be enriched. So that's one thing that we've learned. So we think that that's a very key biomarker for people that either have functional constipation or constipation predominant IBS. Another thing that we have, you know, recurrently seen, and 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 this is very fascinating and powerful, is people who are dealing with like IBDs, especially like UC. We've seen that a lot of them colitis. actually, yeah, colitis. They're dealing with. They all have very, very. Most of them have very low levels of short chain fatty acid producers, especially butyrate. 
Mm, um, yeah, most of that, most of them, the, it is a significant difference when you compare to people who say that they are healthy and who don't have UC um, diagnosis. Um, and that also makes sense because we know that the short-chain fatty acids contribute to um, improving your gut barrier integrity. And that is what we see is heavily compromised in individuals that have UC. And this is also, this also tends to be an underlying factor. And we actually saw this, we were looking at this just last week. Um, this is also true for people that have autoimmune disorders, right? Like, mm. you know, people that have autoimmune disorders. High tend to see, no, compromise of your gut barrier integrity, low short chain fatty acid producers. Oh, the low, low butyrate. Got it. Yeah. Oh, low butyrate. Yeah. So these are some really? of the really interesting things that, that we have seen just looking at thousands of data and a lot of them correlated to some of what we already know in literature, just some of them, things that we don't really have a lot of information on, but now it's good to learn those things. And I think that's the next phase of what we're thinking of is how to make sense of that data, push them out so that more people can read about them. What about SIBO? Is that something that you could get biomarkers for from your test? I think it's a really, really good question. Um, no. So indirectly, yes. Directly, no, because SIBO is everything happening in the small intestine, right? Um, your gut test actually gives you a picture of what's happening in your gut lumen. That's the, the liminal component of your gut, of your large intestine. Um, but I think that SIBO in itself, the way it's diagnosed is, um, it's not particularly efficient because you're likely to get either lots of false negatives or false positives. And just, for example, if you're doing a lactulous breath test, you know, it's, you know, you, you're giving that test meal that contains lactulose and then you're expecting that on the other side, like after the present stays for like 120 to 180 minutes or however long that they're going to produce hydrogen sulfide and that's going to be captured by the breath test. But we have seen consistently in studies that, you know, people's oral cycle transit time are different. Like Asians have a different oral cycle transit time versus white people versus black people. And so it's difficult to actually map that and say, oh, because you've stayed for 120 minutes, um, this is, you know, you have an overgrowth or you don't have an overgrowth. And that's and that's unsurprising when you read meta-analysis that actually show that lactulose breath test, for example, has 42% sensitivity. That, that is to say that six out of 10 people who take the test are actually going to get a false negative. That's that's a lot. That all right. Lot. And you know, and 70% um specificity that is say that three out of 10 people who did the test will get a false positive. And so what happens is that when you're doing a gut microbiome test, take people that have, you know. Um, SIBO with comorbidities of IBS, we tend to see that, you know, if you do a gut microbiome test and you see high levels of organisms such as disulfovibro, um, bilophila, these are all hydrogen sulfide producing organisms. We tend to see that those tend to correlate with people that are actually having, um, that actually have um, diarrhea predominant IBS. All right. So you have SIBO, but you have diarrhea predominant IBS. We tend to see that that actually um, kind of like correlates. And when I think about that, that makes sense because, you know, if you have, if you're producing a lot of hydrogen sulfide, it probably means that, you know, there's a lot of bile acids that's, that's been produced and bile in itself has that osmotic pressure that can draw water into, into the colon. So, um, you can learn a lot by doing a microbiome test in combination with your SIBO test, and that can actually give you a better insight into what can I treat in the large intestine versus what is an overgrowth in the upper bowel. What is how is longevity tied to our microbiome, and can you see that from your test? Oh yeah, yeah. that's that's I think that's uh, that's a good question. I mean, one way is you know the way microorganisms pretty much just metabolize active ingredients of food. All right. Um, and, and we've seen that with things like myrosinus. Myrosinus is an enzyme that is only produced by gut bacteria. Um, um, you, you eat certain foods um, that are rich in isothiocyanates, and this my myrosinase, if you have the organisms that have the genetic capacity to produce myrosinase, they, they metabolize them to produce products that have not just you know, anti-aging properties, but they have antioxidant properties, et cetera. Another is urolithin. Urolithin is actually made from, you know, metabolism of food through your gut bacteria. And I think that this is why in the longevity space, the conversation of gut microorganisms and gut, gut microbiome should, should come in because um, there's a lot of product that are considered to have all these anti-aging properties, but those products um, only come to be by the metabolism 
of the substrates that you have been, you know, that you are feeding yourself with. And those that metabolism is only aided by your gut bacteria. So yes, absolutely. There's a very strong link between your gut microorganisms and longevity. When you say urolithin, is that the same thing as urolithin A? Yes, that it is. Because we we are working with um with timeline and I know that they have the urolithin A. So well, very uh, interesting. So is that yeah. that would be that's kind of what you're referring to when you say urolithin? Yes, that is what I'm referring to. Interesting. Oh, that's really cool. Is there anything that we didn't talk, and I know I asked you a lot of questions, but is there anything that we <laughs> didn't talk about today that you want to mention before we end the interview? And again, I want to make sure, Linda, that you let everybody know what our special is, our discount. And also, I had the test done, so I know I'm asking you a whole bunch of questions, and I wanted to just come from a place of someone who's never had the test, but I had the test done. I absolutely loved it. And now what I'm doing is I'm working on some things and I'm going to have, I'd love to have both of you back once I've made some changes to see how it affects my test. So I, I'm excited and I'm excited for all of you who are listening. I highly recommend getting it done. It's so eye, eye opening and the test, the cost of the test is $150 US. And uh, actually I do have one more question before you answer what we didn't talk about is how does it differ from the other gut tests, uh, the other gut tests on the market, like the GI map, which I know is very expensive. Mm -hmm. I think the main difference is the fundamental approach with which you're looking at the microbiome. So with other screening tests, um, the, the way that they're designed is they have pre-selected uh, pathogen screens and they will go out and look for those uh, specific pathogens. And then they'll either say this was picked up or not picked up uh, versus the approach that we take is a microbiome mapping approach. We're trying to map the entire microbiome so that we can figure out this complex jungle. How does it all work together? How, how, like, what is the composition of the microbiome? Because that, as you can tell from this conversation, is what really paints the picture of what's happening in the gut. And the way we like to always explain to, a, to practitioners or customers is there is a place always for a different type of testing in your toolbox. But I would always go to a microbiome mapping sort of foundational test first before saying, all right, you know, we've done it. We've exhausted all those, the possible options that we had. And now we're looking for this, you know, very specific pathogen that I suspect that you have. And so it's worth it to spend all this additional money, run a pathogen screen and see what, see if something is picked up. Um, so that's kind of the, the fundamental difference is in the, is in the sort of molecular techniques with which, um, we're, we're picking up what's in the microbiome. Jadozi, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah. I mean, for the listeners, I, I just wanted to mention that, you know, if you're interested in root, root cause medicine, um, the microbiome actually sits at the heart of it. And I think that, you know, the, the bigger, the, the bigger fascination actually is, you know, the understanding that we're getting to have every single day about the gut microbiome. You know, every month we have over 2000 papers that are published that mentions the microbiome. It's not just the gut microbiome, it's the like skin microbiome, it's the lung microbiome, it's every kind of microbiome. And I think that this is, this is really, really important. I think that the next, you know, phase, which I'm very excited that, you know, companies like ours are, are you know, being part of is how we can condense all that information, how we can make sense of it into tools um, that are viable and can actually help people gain more insights into their health and help them improve their symptoms. How long should somebody wait between getting tests? So they get a test done and then they want to make changes. When should they retest or should they retest? Yes, we encourage people to retest. Um, we typically encourage um, when you take a test, you should retest in three months. Um, although I must mention that, you know, there's different skills of, you know, these different types of responders. So people are fast responders. Things can happen in one month and they're already seeing the changes. But on the average, we, we say three months. And I think that's, you know, this is actually another powerful part of what we're doing is that it's we go beyond just giving you that snapshot. When you're retesting, we can kind of like follow up three months later, see if the interventions that you're taking are actually working, seeing the impact they're making on your gut microbiome, and also observe if those changes correlate with the new symptoms or like the disappearance of the symptoms that that you used to have three months prior to the intervention. I was just gonna say, like once you fix it, or let's we'll call it fix for the sake of using the vocabulary, um, for understanding standpoint. 
but once you make those changes, is it, you know, good for a certain amount of time? Is it good for always? Is it just, I mean, obviously everything's changing all the time and depending what yeah. you're putting into your body, what you're exposed to and all that. But for the most part, like it's, it should they, should the listeners be listening to how they feel. So for example, if they had, let's say gas and bloating and now they don't anymore, but then it comes back, that's where you know things are shifting again. Yes, I think it's a very fascinating question. Um, I like to say this lightheartedly uh, when I'm talking to practitioners that at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter like, you know, how long you want people to do this test. Like if people are feeling better, they're feeling better. So yes, to your point, the first thing is you should listen to your body. So you did a gut microbiome test at the time you you did it, say you had bloating or you were constipated and now you've done the test. We've seen some signatures that we think might be contributing to your symptoms and your practitioner has put you under some sort of intervention. You've done that for two, three months and you feel better. That's the best time to take the test again. See if those things that were high at the time you were having those symptoms are now low. And if mm -hmm. that correlates with, you know, okay. how you now feel, then it makes sense that, okay, those might actually be the culprit. And that helps you to actually take your health to the next level by truly understanding what's happening there. And now we can go back to the question I asked you originally, because I'm always like, okay, I thought of other things. Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you want to leave our listeners with? I think the last thing I want to leave you guys with is one of Chidozi and I's mission is making the microbiome field less elusive. You know, you have field experts like Chidozi who have decades of experience in, in microbiology and, and molecular genetics and that and Chidozi is able to know all these hundreds of bacteria and what they do, their mechanism of action, what does that mean for your health? But where we want to get to is how can we take everything that an expert like Chidozi knows and then translate that in a really simple, meaningful, actionable way to your average consumer and, and our practitioners. So one of the main ways that we've done that is we build a lot of education into the test report itself. If you are a consumer, you just go to the implication section and that's what, and we'll spell it out plain for you. What Easy does it mean if this thing is high or low? And then another initiative that we've just launched last week is something called Fitract University. It is going to be this ever evolving library of microbiome education. Um, and we're really excited to do this because the videos that we have are crisp. They're easy to understand. They're short. They're actionable. They're really built for practitioner in mind um, and super, super affordable. Um, so we just recently launched that. If you're a practitioner and you're interested, um, Viatract University will be live August 1st. Um, so you can go to our website and, and learn more. That's amazing. And Chidozi, given your background, how has the medical community taken to the testing? And have you, do you have any research that's been published yet? Um, in terms of like how the medical community is adopting microbiome test? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think there's been a lot of progress, to be honest. Um, it was much worse like 10 years ago, but there's been a lot of progress. And I say that um, one, um, from the standpoint of you know the practitioners that we're working with every every now and then we're seeing practitioners like integrated medical doctors people who actually have you know are practicing conventional medicine beginning to look at other tools that they can employ in their practices to better understand their patient but in the field as a whole like in 2021 we did see you know the fda approval of you know, Rebiota, which is an FMT treatment for, you know, Clostridium um, clostridioides um, infection, Clostridium um, clostridioides difficile infection. Um, we know that, right? yes, C. difficile. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that this is a lot of progress in, in the space because, you know, FMT primarily is, you know, telling us that you are beginning to agree that, oh yes, you know, the gut microbiome is make, makes these changes truly indeed that you can actually get a lot of, you know, improvement through, you know, microbiome-based therapies. So I think that when we start to see things like that, and then there's a lot of microbiome research that are in clinical trials now, you know, a lot of interventions, yeah. you know, that are in clinical trials now, um, one of them for depression, you know, there are studies that have actually shown how, you know, you know, gut microbiota from depressed people can be transferred to rats and then those rats will start to show depression symptoms. Like those are, so things are going from just associations now. Um, we're beginning to see beyond just associations to causation and for some conditions. For some conditions, it's still largely up in the air associations, but I think a lot of progress has been made. And this is just the beginning. The more data we collect, 
from 16S to shotgun to meta transcriptomics to metabolomics. As we keep collecting this data, we keep understanding what's happening. And I think that that's the future and that's what we're most excited about. What about people who are on antibiotics and or people who have had colonoscopies? Have you done any testing around that? Because, you know, when it wipes out the gut microbiome, the, the, all the bacteria and all the other things, it, is it just the bacteria, I guess, in the gut that it wipes out? Have you done any research around that or how do people repopulate their gut bacteria? Yeah, I mean, primarily for antibiotics, we haven't done any research, but I think the understanding about this is actually pretty clear in literature. We know like one of the, one of the you know downsides of antibiotics, as as good as they can be, you know, and, and I and I want to put this out there, like antibiotics, you know, if you need to take them, you should take them, right? Absolutely, exactly, yeah. right. So one of the you know biggest inventions of the of the twentieth century. Um, but I think that you know what what we have seen in, in literature is that you know antibiotics generally just have collateral damages, like they have broad spectrum activity, and part of the collateral damage. Other beneficial organisms that are there modulating all of these processes, keeping your gut homeostasis intact. Um, but we have also seen that repopulation actually works. It's like, you know, you see the probiotics and we usually encourage, you know, after you're done with your antibiotics regimen, then you can start seeding. Some groups say you can do that concurrently, but, you know, from literature, we think that we've seen better outcomes when you actually introduce the probiotics after the antibiotic regimen. And That's then you can question. then get yeah, yeah, that's what I, so because it's cleared out, but then you can repopulate it. And how and long can does it generally it. take to repopulate it? Again, it depends. It depends mm. on like, you know, and that's where the personalization comes in. Like some people, it's easier mm. for them to repopulate. Some people, it's harder. And the reason this DFAR is because we have seen in academic literature that the structure of your microbiome prior to repopulating actually matters. All right. So mm -hmm. it depends on the antibiotic you took. It depends on the species of organisms it wiped out. It depends, like, you know, the structure matters. And that's actually probably what stratifies people into different archetypes of respondents. So should people not do the test if they've just taken a round of antibiotics or they've had a colonoscopy? Should they wait? It depends on what you're looking for. If, mm. I, if they're as curious as I am, for example, if I just took a round of antibiotic, I would take the test. I would try to see the things mm -hmm. that are off there so that when I start repopulating, I'll see if the things I'm repopulating are actually increasing my gut diversity. So it depends on what they're looking for. So fascinating. How could people find out more about, where can they find out more information about the testing? And if they want to, well, I'll put a link below if you want to purchase one, we'll put an affiliate link, which is great. And then if you use the code MORPHUS10, M-O-R-P-H-U-S-10, you'll get 10% off, which is amazing. So how could people find out more about you? And are you on social media? Yes, we are. Um, we'll send you more information about that. We can link it in the bios. Um, but the best way to reach us and learn more about the testing itself is on the website, which is just vitract.com or vitract.ca. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're more than happy to interact with people on social media as well. Chidozi and I make ourselves very avail available to our to to our clinical team, um, as well as have a robust team of PhDs and are very responsive to customers who need help. Um, so we're we're more than happy to to you know um, be responsive and when people need it. Can they find you at Vitract? Is that what your social handle is? Yes, Vitract official. Okay, sure, sure. Thank you both for doing this. It was very fascinating. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you for having us, Andrea. It was good. It was a good chat. Well, that was such a fascinating conversation, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Our gut microbiome, our gut health is so important. We know now that our gut is our second brain. We know that gut health is so important for immunity, for mental health, for digestion, and so much more. So if you wanted to try Vitrack, get the test done. Like I said, I did it. I did it for my daughter. I did it for my mother. And everybody was pretty blown away by what the results were. I highly recommend trying it. Be sure to use the code MORPHUS10, M-O-R-P-H-U-S-10. I put a link below as well with the code below so you don't have to memorize it. If you enjoyed today's interview, please share it because the more you share shows you care. And please take a moment to leave a review. I would be super grateful because when you leave a review, especially if it's a good one, it tells the algorithm to send out our podcast to more people so that we can help more women who are going through perimenopause and menopause. Thank you for spending the last, I think it's about an hour and a bit with me. I really appreciate it. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing, but you chose to spend your time with me. And for that, I'm grateful. I'll see you at the next interview.